Hello and welcome to Talking Europe. I'm Armand Georgian at the European Parliament in Brussels. Paying for tax cuts and for income support, that's the challenge facing Italy's new government and the source of great concern in the Eurozone establishment. The winners of the parliamentary election in Italy, Five Star and the League, are adamant both their programmes can be satisfied, but they admit this will require renegotiating fiscal rules. What happens if Brussels refuses to do that? And that's not the only trouble brewing. The German Chancellor Angela Merkel is trying to slow down the French president's push for more political union in the Eurozone, ambitions that Emmanuel Macron wants on the agenda for the European elections next May. So with all these various tensions, where exactly is the Eurozone heading? Uh, for this debate, I'm joined by Italian MEP Roberto Gualtieri, who is president of the Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee here at the Parliament. He is a member of the Group of Socialists and Democrats. Welcome to you. Thank you. Joining me also is German MEP Bernd Lucke, who used to be the national spokesperson for the Alternative for Germany, or AFD party. He's an economist by training and is a member of the Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee here uh, in the European Parliament. And he's a member of the Group of Conservatives and Reformists. Welcome to you as well. Um, so, Bent, look, if I could start with you, uh, I would imagine that your view of this Italian government is that it's the product of uh, failed policies in the Eurozone. Uh, quite right, yes. Uh, I think there are basically two causes for the uh, Italian voters to having elected this uh, government. One is certainly dissatisfaction with the handling of the migration crisis in the European Union. And the other cause is the economic misery, which we witness in Italy now for 20 years. Basically, since Italy has uh, acceded to the euro, Italy has not experienced any kind of growth, right? And this hits Italy very, very severely because other countries are growing and sometimes growing strongly. And voters are asking whose responsibility is this? And then they become disenchanted with the former governments and vote for some type of protest parties. Roberto Gualtieri, this is the result of business as usual in the Eurozone establishment? No, I think it is a bit too simplistic view. Of course, the fact that Italy has been hit very hardly by the crisis, and in particular by the wrong policy mix that at the time the EU put into place, too much austerity oriented, has contributed in uh, um, producing uh, in Italy a, a, a social crisis which is very deep. Uh, but there are also other factors, in my view, that, uh, that can explain this, uh, this fact that those two parties have, have won the elections, uh, uh, including uh, what happened in Italy politically in those years. So it's a bit a uh, simplistic view. But, but austerity and, uh, was a, a major, a major yeah, driving force. Yeah, yeah. And, and we, and have, uh, the problem, the, we have the problem that uh, the politics is a bit lower than the, than the economy. Now, actually, thanks to, to the previous government, uh, Italy has been growing in the last years. Actually, it's been growing. We had uh, one million more jobs. So the uh, economy is recovering. But the recession has been so deep that the social uh, uh, problems uh, remain. So that's uh, contributed to create this sense of feeling of anxiety. And then there is also the, the issue of migration. Uh, but there are also other reasons. So, mm. Ben, look, do, do you think uh, this, this government has sent a signal that will actually be listened to in Brussels or Luxembourg? I think very much so, because they have responded with, with something which I would say is just a disastrous economic uh, concept they have uh, presented. I mean, they, they wanted to uh, increase expenditure by a great, great amount, and when they wanted to decrease revenues, government revenues, and then they wanted to uh, have earlier uh, retirement age, so they want to work less, spend more, and, and have less, less revenues. They have backed down now in the final version of the coalition uh, agreement, but they have sent the signal, this is what we are capable of doing if if we do not receive some kind of cooperation, some kind of transfer, some kind of payments, some, some goodwill from the European Union when in terms say, of money. When you say this is what we're capable of doing, as in blowing out the budget deficit. That's it. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. No, and but, pro possibly risking a sovereign default. Although, yes, that, that's... No, but this is an important yes. point, and I have to say that in this case I agree with, with Bern. Uh, the, the European fiscal rules have, have nothing to do with this programme. Because uh, this is not because of European fiscal rule that Italy cannot spend 120 billion 
without any revenue covering them, because that would bring the deficit to nearly 10 percent. And, and this is independent from your. So actually, you could do because uh, there are no. Uh, so the rules, uh, you go in an excessive deficit procedure. But at the end, you could do in theory. But the problem is nobody will buy your public debt. So it's not an issue of rules. So Except the way ECB. the way in which they are no, because that you would not be even eligible for that. So the way in which they are creating the false impression that there is a negotiation with the EU uh, while putting into place policies which are unsustainable, but also uh, deeply unfair, uh, because one element is very important of this programme, which costs 120 billion at the minimum, uh, more than half of the money comes from the so-called flat tax, which would be a measure which would benefit increasingly the richest part of the population. But so not those who have voted for them, but the super rich. Well, so they, it, so they would bring the, 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 higher, the higher break of taxation from 43% yeah, yeah. to 20%. So for, for the richest. So it would be, it's, it's incredible how they are uh, using the votes of, of the poorest part of the population to, to present a measure which so blatantly favours the super rich. Let, let's just put both of you uh, on pause with respect, because I think for our viewers, as we can bring some more facts and figures about Italy's debt so we can all have a clearer idea of uh, exactly what we're talking about. Here's a, a closer look at uh, the Italian economy and its uh, public debt uh, in this France 24 report. Let's have a look. Political turmoil in the Eurozone's third largest economy has observers worried about stability of the single currency bloc. The Italian economy grew at just 1.5 percent last year lagging behind the Eurozone average of 2.5 percent, although it was the country's strongest expansion since 2010. And the country's budget deficit fell last year within EU guidelines to 1.9 percent of GDP. But Italy has amounted a colossal debt of 2 trillion euros. At 132 percent of GDP, it's the second highest debt to GDP ratio in the European Union after Greece. The head of Italy's central bank has warned failure to reduce the country's debt could lead to economic chaos. There are no shortcuts to reducing Italy's debts. The financial crisis that would follow would lead to this country taking many steps backwards. Italian lenders have been struggling to emerge from a pile of bad loans that threaten the country's banking system. The Bank of Italy has forecast 65 billion euros in sales of bad loans this year. And unemployment in Italy remains relatively high at 10.9 percent, compared with an EU average of 8.7 percent. Almost a third of the country's youth, between the ages of 15 and 24, are unemployed. Um, so, Bernd Luca, you mentioned earlier this possibility of, or the scenario of a sovereign debt default. Of course, Jean-Claude Juncker, the EU Commission president, has said that's very unlikely because we're not in the same uh, general eurozone fragility, as was the case in 2011, but you still believe that the, in this worst-case scenario it's possible? I, I don't really think that it will happen, but I think uh, they will use the scenario of a sovereign default as, a, as an instrument uh, to trigger uh, transfers, financial transfers, from the rest of the eurozone. So they will put this up as a threat, much as um, the, the new Minister of European Affairs has already done when he presented his uh, approach to curing Italy's problems and said, well, the possibility of a default is the deterrence we use in order to get compromises from the Eurozone. Mm. And I think this is what they will do. And I'm, I'm pretty sure the Eurozone governments will compromise on these issues and they will say, well, we have to support Italy and, and we will establish some kind of uh, transfer mechanisms. I mean, look at uh, Mrs. Merkel, the German mm. chancellor, who has just... You know, at the week and after the new Italian government has been uh, installed, she has put up a proposal of establishing a Eurozone budget which would help out for crisis But countries. much smaller than what Emmanuel Macron wanted. I mean, it's but being still it's, considered a very it's modest... It's a signal which uh, is being received yeah. in Rome. Yeah. Of course, yeah. she will not put everything on the table at one yeah. time, but she is sort of conceding. We are ready to talk. We are ready, ready to give yeah. money. She has actually told, you know, money would be something like two-digit billions of, of, of euros, mm -hmm. and then it's for the Italian government to listen to that and come up with more demands. So, so do you agree that there's a <laughs> no, sort of blackmail? No, I totally disagree. I mean, this is, I, I respect the, the need of internal German politics here, yes, Dr. Merkel, but I, I, I fully understand that. But the two things have nothing to do. Of, of course, the idea that uh, uh, we could go to a deficit to 10% and, and then say to Europe, then 
uh, you have to give Italy the, the money for, for paying for reducing the tax for the riches is ridiculous. So this simply will not happen. So if, if this government would go for this kind of leg mail, it would be a disaster for our country. So I, I think, honestly, the most likely they will simply will not be able to implement any of those policies. So they will fail politically uh, very soon. That's my personal personal prediction. Another thing is what we are trying to do to, to, to make more stable, more resilient, uh, uh, more complete our economic and monetary union. And this has nothing to do to giving money to country to relax their, their behavior or, or, or implement unsustainable policies. This has to do with having a stronger, a fairer, a more uh, more capable of producing growth and jobs, Europe. But this is a, a right thing that we have to do. But, but the two things are totally uh, separated and connecting them is, is just a very, I mean, cl clever political uh, uh, approach for a debate, but it's, it's not what is true. Do you think that um, if they do fail, I mean, these uh, two parties that won the, the largest share of the votes, um, Roberto Gualteri is saying that could kind of reduce their support if people see they can't achieve these aims, but it could also swell their support because people will be even more angry. I, I guess that might be your prediction. No, absolutely not. I, I think they must not fail, the mm. five stars and, and, and the league. I mean, they have mm. this one-time chance as protest parties because there's a deep mistrust in all the other parties in, in Italy. So voters have voted for these kind of anti-establishment parties, mm. and it is now their task to succeed. If they don't succeed, then I think they will be done with, right? Mm. So I, I think they will be determined to succeed. And if mm. they cannot trigger more money from the Eurozone, and I think they will do this, and they will do this in some type of blackmail, I completely agree with you uh, there. If they are unable to do this, then they will go for a crash mm. course, mm. right? Mm. Then they will increase the, 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 the public uh, deficit, and then they, they will pay for expenses because they believe they can trigger growth by raising government expenditure and, and decreasing taxes and these kind of things. And this will blow up the deficit and will probably end in a disaster for, for Italy unless the Eurozone gives in and, and helps out by telling the European Central Bank to buy Italian government debt, you know, of which they have not yet bought or, or they can, can buy legally. So there is still leeway to finance the, yeah. the Italian government by kind of, you know, money creation from the side of the European Central Bank. And Emmanuel Macron might actually be a sort of unlikely ally because he does seem to want more common Eurozone budgets and things of Absolutely. that kind. Absolutely. His proposals go that way, yes. Yeah, no, but, but, but Angela no, Merkel... Sorry. 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 Double... But this is really nothing to do. To put together Macron proposals has... <laughs> uh, with uh, the policies of this populist government in Italy have, have, have nothing to do, honestly. is a, is a, is a, a, is a propaganda. Thing. No, it's no. But, but, but no, not it's a deliberate... No, it's, no, it's not a convergence because uh, that's that the tool that we want to build to make a stronger, more resilient Europe are not done to support uh, unsustainable policies. And that would not be an eligible for those kind of policies because one thing, and may, here I, I may diverge, I think that uh, I am against the, the balanced budget, super austerity uh, fiscal line. I'm a, I'm a Keynesian. I think that uh, you need to support public investment, uh, that, that there is the need for counter-cyclical economic policies. But this has nothing to do. This is nothing to do with what this government is proposing. This government is just proposing uh, uh, to 120 billion of expensing, the expenses that, by the way, do not even support the productivity, but just are uh, for, for uh, changing the pension reform or reducing tax for the super rich. So this is really nothing to do with, mm. with a normal. So uh, not, let's not mix those two sure. debates because that would simply poison so, the first so one, which is a serious one. Realistically, what do you think this Italian government can do then within the existing Eurozone rules and given the promises that they've made to, to their own electorates? Have they got any room for any sort of manoeuvre? As I said, the problem, and, uh, the problem is not the Eurozone rules. Is the simple fact that Italy has to finance its public debt, and even a country without public debt could not afford to, 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 to pursue those policies, which are simply crazy, very badly designed. In no a country of uh, Western uh, Europe there is the flat tax because we have a progressive taxation system, and with this money we finance our welfare. So it's a simply basic, basic uh, social model. So they are they have a contradicting. 
elements in their programs. They want the basic income, but the flat tax at the same time. They, they say they, they say they will uh, finance this by cutting uh, expenses, but at the same time they say they don't want to cut expenses. So it's, it's a program which is a typical uh, definition of what is a populist program. But this cannot work. Cannot work. Social so it's, model. Uh, it's clearly that correct. that cannot work. Okay, we'll have to end it there. Thank you so much for your. Uh, contributions and ideas. Uh, it's now time for our fact or fake segment uh, brought to you uh, this week by Frédéric Simon. What was the influence of fake news during the last elections in Italy? This is the question that EU Disinfolab, an NGO based in Brussels, tried to answer when it published an analysis of the most widely shared content in social networks during the elections. The good news is that fake news have been relatively rare, according to the report, which nevertheless draws attention to two examples. The first is a video of a migrant who was filmed on a train during a check, supposedly without a valid ticket. The video quickly went viral on Facebook, but the Italian train company Trenitalia subsequently published a rebuttal. In fact, the man did have a ticket, he was just sitting in the wrong seat. And his explanation on the video appears confused because he doesn't speak Italian. The second example involves a fake story which claimed that a substantial number of ballot papers had been discovered in Sicily as part of a ballot stuffing operation in favour of the centre-left Democratic Party. The fake story was quickly exposed on social media, but it still attracted a lot of attention on the day of the election. However, apart from these two examples, the authors of the report make a relatively positive assessment. According to them, fake news did not have an overwhelming influence on the Italian elections. That was our fact or fake segment. Many thanks again to my guests, Roberto Gualtieri and Bernd Luca. And do join us in a few moments for part two of Talking Europe. Thanks for watching. Because a new page of history gets written every day. Because breaking news can't wait. Information everywhere. In all situations. On every subject. Understanding the world. Imagining the world. France 24. A different take on the news.